It's not your job to make excuses. You trade pain. That's all you guys do good! People will come, Ray. This chocolate all over this ball. You're killing me, Small. I'm up in the middle of the grade. Had your breakfast? You don't think as a team. You don't play as a team. You don't even lose as a team. Then he is going to play on this ball club. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. What is going on? everybody and welcome back to the hum baby baseball channel this is eric and it's baseball movie monday and today we'll be reviewing moneyball which was voted on by my subscribers so make sure to hit that subscribe button so you can get the poll and vote for next week's and every week's baseball movie that i'll be reviewing and i'm only so happy to review moneyball this is one of my favorite movies of all time i was so excited back in 2011 when this hit theaters because we're talking about a movie that's not about as much as I love the movies about Babe Ruth or Jackie Robinson or Shoeless Joe Jackson or Mickey Mantle. All that is awesome. The classic baseball movies about the all-time legends. This is a movie with Jeremy Giambi in it. This is a movie where an actor portrays Dave Justice. How awesome is that? This is a movie where Philip Seymour Hoffman, one of my favorite actors of all time, portrays A's manager Art Howe. I was so pumped up. Not only that, but one of the biggest superstars in Hollywood, Brad Pitt, portrays Billy Bean, the A's general manager in this movie. So right there, you know, I'm there day one to watch this movie at the theaters. I was a little worried on how this movie would translate. I'm sorry, how this book would translate to the big screen because originally it was a book called Moneyball, a book that I've read multiple times and I really enjoy about this A's team that has a very small budget compared to some of the bigger market teams. How are they able to compete when the Yankees, with the Yankees, when the Yankees have a payroll four, five, six times what the A's have? And they can pretty much buy any player they want. And even if the A's do draft well and end up with some really good players like a Jason Giambi or a Jason Isringhausen, well, these teams like the Yankees and Red Sox are just gonna snag them up the first opportunity they can. So how are the A's supposed to compete? And the book is really interesting in how Billy Bean was able to use more modern analytics to try to not buy big superstars that are going to cost a bunch of money, but to buy runs, to buy wins, worrying more about on-base percentage and all of the newer analytical stuff that we know. Sometimes it goes overboard for a lot of us, but you can't argue with success. The kind of success we've seen from the Tampa Bay Rays lately and the kind of success we've seen from the Oakland A's, especially back in 2002. And that's where this movie takes place. This is a year after the A's won over 100 games thanks to guys like Jason Giambi and Jason Isringhausen, like I just said, and, and Matt Damon, among others. And they lost all of them. They lost all of them to free agency. And now how the hell are they going to compete? They are in a big bind right here trying to figure out how the hell they're supposed to replace all of this production that they've lost going into the 2002 season and it just didn't seem like something that's going to translate really well to the big screen i figured i would enjoy it but would the average moviegoer enjoy it would they be would they be able to make it entertaining enough and to me, the answer is hell yes. Now, obviously, again, I enjoyed it as a baseball fan, but I also thought the movie was hilarious. I laughed out loud multiple times, not in a stupid way, not in an unnatural way. It's just a funny movie. It's just really well-placed humor, not over the top, just enough, but it's really funny. It is really entertaining. And it is a story about a team that is not doing so well that turns out to be really good just like all these great movies that we've seen like major league or bad news bears or whatever we've seen this story so you place that great story in here with a real life situation so it's based on a true story you add you interject some awesome humor into it as well you cast jonah hill and then you just bring the story to life in an amazing way awesome music and also a backstory on billy bean to make it even more interesting along with how this is affecting some of the old scouts who work for the a's who obviously are feeling like their input doesn't really matter anymore which it really doesn't and so you have all this turmoil going on there you also have players getting an opportunity who probably thought their careers were over but billy bean is giving them an opportunity not because he's being kind-hearted but he's be doing what he thinks is best 
to win as many games as possible and save as much money as possible and be able to buy players who aren't going to cost a fortune, who are still going to help them win just as much as some of these players that are going to demand huge salaries. So that's what the movie is about. It sounds pretty tough to make into an entertaining movie, but they pulled it off. And it's just a movie that I never get tired of watching. And I think most people really love the movie. Love the way this movie starts. It actually uses clips from the actual 2001 playoffs. Interjecting those clips, we see Jason Giambi with the A's and everything. And then it will jump to Billy Bean sitting in the Oakland A's ballpark because the A's are on the road right here. He's sitting there in this empty ballpark. And it's just an awesome scene where he's got the radio turning it on listening he realizes the a's are losing or about to lose turns it off he's trying to collect his thoughts he's obviously unhappy but it's just a really cool shot something about being in that baseball stadium all by himself completely dark just listening to something that's happening all the way across the country and there's nothing you can do about it and it's just i think a great introduction to the movie and then we kind of hear some awesome splicing in these radio shows where we can kind of hear what's going on and as sports fans we can digest we can understand exactly what's happening even if you're not a sports fan they make it pretty clear you know talking about it the yankees the a's are practically a farm system for the yankees they just grab whoever they want and you can see how this offseason is not going very well and they're losing all their great players and the a's are in big trouble and then there's that great meeting between billy bean and the a's owner i would assume where he's talked to him saying, I need more money. I need more money. What am I going to do? And it's a kind of a realistic discussion where, you know, the A's owner is like, look, we are not a big market team. We have to survive and do what we can within the confines of what we have. Did that exact conversation take place? Probably not, but it was realistic looking enough. I could see a similar conversation taking place and it lets the audience know exactly what's going on. So we can actually see some dialogue between the owner and the GM here to get an idea of what's going on. Then you got Billy Bean heading over to Cleveland. And this is a, a, an interesting scene where he actually meets with another GM in person to kind of wheel and deal, discuss trades and things like that. It didn't come across to me as very realistic. Most of that stuff would be done over the phone, but this is a way that he's able to see Peter Brand and eventually start seeing how, why is this GM? Cause he's trying to work a trade here. He's about to get it done. It looks like he's making some progress. And then Peter Brand, this young overweight, kid standing in the corner tells him no don't trade this guy and he says up oh, he's off the table now and Billy Bean's like why why is he listening to this kid what does this kid know so it, it is an interesting way to make him meet Peter Brand who is not a real person it's more of a it, it is a there is a person he's kind of based on but they changed his name and everything he's more of a composite character based on two or three existing guys and I kind of agree with that because it makes the movie a little bit better without, you know, having the realistic situation. You have three different guys that, that Billy Bean is working with and everything. I think it's just a lot more fun as a movie where you just have the one GM in Billy Bean and he is playing off Jonah Hill. And I think that just makes the movie that much more entertaining. And it's fine. It's Jonah Hill's a composite of multiple different guys. But ultimately, he is the Yale graduate genius who explains what he's doing to Billy Bean. He explains why he liked that guy and why he would not pay as much money as the Yankees and Red Sox are for some of the guys, especially he mentioned Johnny Damon. How Johnny Damon's a really good player. He can produce some runs. He can steal some bases. He's a good baseball player, but is he worth the seven and a half million dollars a year? No, no. And he tells Billy Bean, hey man, I think I think it's a good thing you lost him. Again, these conversations probably didn't play, take place. I don't think he flies over to Cleveland to make deals front face to face, especially with a room with all these guys in it. They're all Cleveland Indians guys. Like where's Billy Beans guys? It didn't really make sense, but it was a way for him to run into Peter Brand. And then he ends up hiring him, actually ends up buying him. And he calls him and says, I bought you. You're moving, pack your bags, moving to Oakland. Another thing that I found probably unlikely that something like that could happen, because we're not talking about a player. We're talking about an employee. I don't think you can just buy him and force him to move all the way to Oakland from Cleveland. But, hey, we'll accept this because this sets the stage where, yeah, Peter Brand and Billy Bean working together on this new analytical money ball system. And then you have this great scene at the meeting with all these scouts 
And I love this scene because the scout, he's just sitting there. Billy Bean is just sitting there listening. And all the scouts are doing their normal thing, talking about, you know, this guy, the ball just pops off his bat, pops off his bat. Got a great jaw. This guy's, this kid's really great. Uh, he's going to, he's going to do big things. Billy Bean's sitting there like, um, if he's such a good hitter, why doesn't he hit? Looking at his stats here. Such a great hitter, why didn't he hit? And they're talking about body types and all this. And he's sitting there like, dude, we ain't, we ain't looking for Fabio here. I don't care what someone looks like. And so he rejects all of the ideas and all the players that these scouts who have been doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, anyone that they're interested in, by the way, these scouts just cast great. They sound great. The way they talk is so natural. The way they look, the way they act, their behavior, all that just feels authentic. It does just a great job of casting these guys that are just... They don't even seem like actors. They think it seem like real scouts there. But Billy Bean doesn't want any of the guys that these old time scouts want. He starts throwing these names on the board, talking about we're getting Jeremy Giambi, Jason's little brother. The scouts are like, no, no, no. We're gonna get Dave Justice. Scouts are like, dude, this dude is washed. No way. No way he'll be lucky to hit his weight, you know, come July and August. No, nope, that's who I want. We want him because he gets on base. He gets on base. Then Scott Hatterberg, dude, his arm is done. His career is over. We want Scott Hatterberg. He gets on base. We'll teach him to play first base, even though he's only played catcher. And you start throwing all these names out, and the scouts are just dismayed. But this is what it is. And finally, they figure out that he's just listening to this kid, this young guy named Peter Brand, played by, again, Jonah Hill. And... This is the whole idea. And then you have another dynamic in this movie that I love. And that is the manager not really using the system that they created. He's playing Pena out there at first base instead of Hatterberg. They picked up Hatterberg to play first base. And he's throwing Pena out there. Pena is like the superstar of the team, according to the manager. But that's not the plan. The plan is Hatterberg is going to play first base. Pena is going to be on the bench. Jeremy Giambi is going to be in the lineup. And he's not doing what he's supposed to do. He's, his lineup card, you would have thought... Of course, he would have involved the manager in all this, but that was just an oversight, a mistake by Billy Bean. So Billy Bean talks to him, explains, hey, this is my mistake. I should have involved you from the beginning, but I need you to go ahead and play Hatterberg at first base, and we have to do this. This is how the team was constructed. But Art Howe is like, nope, sorry, the lineup card's mine. I'm going to do what I can do to win games, and you do what you can do. You assemble the team, I play the team. The lineup card is mine. But in order to combat that, I mean, they could have just fired Art Howe, but instead, I like it better that Billy Bean just starts trading guys. He trades Pena. And then you have that great conversation where he's like, hey, you ain't playing Pena today. He's like, well, I am playing Pena. Nothing you can do about it. Oh, really? Because he plays for Cleveland now. You freaking traded Pena? And such and such, and such and such, and such and such. And I optioned this guy. And, oh, by the way, and that's when uh, uh, Jeremy Giambi walks in and says, hey, Jeremy, we, uh, we traded you. To Philadelphia. Have a nice day. You're a good ball player. Good luck to you. He walks out. He's like, oh yeah, we also traded Jeremy. So he has no choice but to pretty much play the team that was assembled the way that he that uh, Billy Bean wants him to play the team or he's just going to trade guys until he does because he can do it all day long. So finally, Hatterberg gets his shot at first base and the team is playing as designed. And there's also more trades that are done during the trade deadline. Really cool scenes. Even though, again, I think that trades don't just happen. You don't just pick up the phone and say, hey, hey, Sabian. Hey, Sabi, 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 Sabes. Hey, I'll give you this guy. You give me that guy. Huh? What do you think? Okay, call me back. Uh, boom. Okay, done. It, it's more of a process that takes phone calls of weeks on, sometimes probably months on end where you're negotiating back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, you know, but for the movie purposes, that would be boring. Let's just be honest. That would be more boring. This is more exciting. This was really cool at the trade deadline, making these calls, hanging up. It's like, why are they calling back? And they are there calling, calling, calling. Got Peter on the phone also helping out and they get the trade done. Like, yeah, yeah, we got it. And they pick up Carlos Rincon and it's just a really cool stuff. I mean, even though, yeah, it's not completely authentic to how maybe it would really go down, it's close enough. I mean, in those last few minutes when the trade finally gets done, you do have to finalize a trade at some point. So it's just kind of an, a, an accelerated version of how trades go down, but it's still really exciting just to see it go down here and uh, love that scene at the trade deadline. It's one of my favorite scenes in the movie. And this is around when they get hot and the A's win, win, win. You see something in the music and the way it shows the standings um, and a way you can hear again some radio shows in the background. It's like, what's going on in Oakland? Something crazy is going on. You hear different voices, some voices where you recognize because these are real sportscasters and, and, and sports personalities who we can hear as it shows what's happening, clips from the games, then clips from newspaper standings and all that. And it just kind of 
sequences that are just awesome. That is really, you can feel something magic happening, something, something special happening. And then there's that 20th game in a row to break the record where the A's have a huge 11-0 lead at this point. Billy Bean turns on the radio because he was driving to Visalia to check out the minor league team. He hears it's 11 0. He's like, Shane, worry about it because he didn't want to jinx them. But once he finds out it's 11 0, he feels like it's in the bag. So he drives back to check out the game. But then the Royals start a comeback. And before you know it, it's tied up 11 11. I believe it was 11 11, but it was tied up. And then in the bottom of the ninth inning, if I'm not mistaken, Hatterberg steps up to the plate and hits this home run to win the game. What a moment. And it was just perfect I and mean, everything looked accurate by the way chris pratt as hatterberg is awesome in this movie he looks like him he's he seems just like his personality would be not that i know hatterberg but it just feels right and that home run that whole recreation was on point and they also used a few clips from the actual event i love that they do that and it all lines up because they have it so perfect that when they show the real event a little clip from the real event kind of edit it in to the dramatized version, it is seamless and it's really cool. And that moment is so awesome. Every time I watch it, I have to bust out YouTube and watch the real clip too. So just a great moment there with the Hatterberg home run to win the game and the celebration and everything is so awesome. Um, but then we get, of course, the discussion of how Billy Beans, you know, as cool as it is, he wants to win a ring. That's his ultimate goal. He wants to win a ring. They don't win the ring. He gets offered a job to go be with the Red Sox, which he declines to stay with the A's. And the Red Sox end up winning the 2004 World Series using similar model that Billy Bean had been using. But the movie's really an edge of your seat as far as just rooting for this team. And the flashbacks, too, that I haven't really talked about. There's these flashbacks that so, show Billy Bean's earlier career. And there's a young actor who portrays the young Billy Bean who really does look like a young Brad Pitt. It's pretty amazing, but he looks pretty good. It doesn't really take me out of the movie at all, even though it's a different actor who portrays the younger Billy Bean. Struggling as he got drafted, it shows how that those old drafts would take place, how the old uh, the, the scouts would go speak to the family and the kid and be like, "Yo, this kid's got five tools. They were just worried about the five tools which isn't really the best way to draft. Uh, just because someone can run, just because someone can throw, and just because someone can field, hit, hit for power, that's that's all well and good. But you need to be able to do something at an elite level, especially hit at an elite level. Otherwise, you're not going to make it. You can be the fastest runner in the world. You can have the greatest armor in the world. If you can't hit, you're not going to make it. And that was Billy Bean's problem. I mean, obviously, he could hit to some extent, but not at a major league level. And so it, it shows a lot of those great flashbacks. Also, a relationship with his daughter, also, a little bit of the relationship with his ex-wife and her new boyfriend or whatever, and, and he's great. Those scenes are, uh, they're not, not really extended, but they do bring a, a bit of humanity to the characters, and especially Billy Bean. And you, you feel for him, he's trying to you know have a relationship with his daughter, and she's awesome. They go to the guitar store, and she's playing the guitar. All that really adds something to the movie. And it makes this a movie that's for everybody. It's just got everything. It's a lot of fun and I really love this film. There is a couple of odd edits that nobody would probably notice but me. There's a point in that game with the Royals where the Royals are actually coming back. The A's pitcher gives up a hit and he's walking off the mound like disappointed. And all of a sudden in this short clip, you see all the fans stand up and start cheering simultaneously. And they're supposed to be A's fans. This is in Oakland. It made no sense. It was really brief. But it was one of those weird edits because when they make these baseball movies, I think they're at the park. They have everyone sit in the same section. They're like, okay, everyone now stand up and cheer. Okay, everybody now, um, you know, do this, do that, do this. And they get the clips and then they edit together and make it look real. But I think they just used an awkward clip that didn't fit. All of a sudden, the A's fans stood up and started cheering like crazy at an awkward moment after the A's had given up a hit. Like, it didn't make any sense that they would be cheering, especially not all at the same time. And the hit had happened a few seconds ago. It was just one of those, just an odd edit that nobody would probably notice but me. But I'm going to point it out because I saw it. I was like, that didn't work. That was weird. Um, but other than that, you did have this storyline about the soda machine. Dave Judge is like, what? I got to pay a, I gotta pay a dollar for a soda? I don't think that's real. If it is, then I apologize. I guess it's not a problem. But I do not believe that A's players had to pay for sodas. And then later when Billy Bean made a trade... He was on the phone with another GM making a trade. He's like, oh, by the way, you also are going to pay for our player sodas. The soda thing was a weird story. Like, why did you have to throw in the soda machine thing and pay for the sodas? And you were going to make a trade and like demand the other GM pay for your player sodas. That's just odd. Like, you're going to have sodas for the players. I mean, that's just how it is. You know, players get their drinks for free. 
But anyway, so you had the soda storyline that I thought, thought was a little out of place. And there's a few little little things here and there, like kind of like the fans thing where I'm like, ooh. But most of the baseball looked great. You saw Dave Justice taking BP. The dude looks like he can hit. That actor has a great swing. And most of the baseball looks on point. Chris Pratt looked, uh, his mannerisms were on point. Um, they just showed enough. You know, they didn't show too much like where you saw anyone who like, dude, that kid, dude can't pitch. Um, also, they didn't have much focus on, you know, Barry Zito and the, the three great pitchers that they had at that time with Zito, Hudson, and um, I'm forgetting the third guy. Let me look it up real quick. Mark Mulder was the third guy. So, yeah, they barely mentioned those three. And those were those three guys were a huge part of that team. I thought it would have been cool, but maybe not. Maybe not. Um, I, I, as a baseball fan, I would like to send a little more focus on those three guys, maybe somewhere. But they, they didn't get completely ignored, although I don't know if Zito was ever mentioned. I would love to see a little Zito in this movie. The movie is fantastic. An absolutely awesome watch. Entertaining all the way. Funny, funny, funny. A very funny movie that will keep you laughing, keep you engaged, entertained, rooting for this team. And a, a just a fantastic story. You, you Jonah Hill is hilarious. And they even interject a little bit of Jeremy Brown, who is a big part of the book. Jeremy Brown is a draft pick, a first round draft pick by the A's. And he's a big part of the book. And there really wasn't a role for him in the movie because he never really made it to the A's very briefly, but he wasn't a part of that 2002 A's team. So he wasn't really a part, he was in the minor leagues, but they did find this awesome scene where Jonah Hill's character is playing a little bit of video for Brad Pitt's character, Billy Bean, because they had just lost and he wants to show, you know, even though it feels like we lost, we really won. And it shows how he tries to run around, he, he hits a ball that he thinks is gonna be an extra base hit. He never tries to run past first because Jeremy Brown's a big guy and he's afraid he's gonna fall down or something but he's going to go for it. He falls over after he passes first base. It's so embarrassed. He crawls back to first. He's like, oh my God, I can't believe I fell down. And everyone's like, bro, the ball went over the fence by 50 feet and it was a home run. And it, so he runs the bases. And that was a really cool shot. It looked, I thought it was, I thought it was a legitimate clip from the Visalia Oaks when I first saw it, this movie in theaters. I was like, is that real? It looks real, but it wasn't. It was actually recreated, a, a recreated clip. I don't know if it really happened. So maybe it wasn't recreated, but it was dramatized and it looked so good. It looked like real minor league players at the minor league ballpark. And it was a really, really awesome. So, uh, so much of this movie is, is, is just authentic looking, even though they took a lot of liberties, most of the liberties, I don't mind. A few of them are a little bit, you know, don't really get it like the soda, but overall the movie is fantastic. I love it. And let's get some ratings for this movie. As far as comedy in this movie, I got to give it a 9 out of 10 because it's a really funny movie. As far as, you know, it's not going to be a 10 out of 10, you know, laugh fest. This ain't Austin Powers, but it's still really a funny movie. So I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10. As far as the drama, I'm going to give this movie a 9.5 out of 10. It has really got some good drama. Really, you're on the edge of your seat rooting for this team. And it's just everything is spliced together and edited in an, a very effective way. So awesome. The baseball reality I'm going to give it a nine and a half as well. It looks real. The players look like they know what they're doing. The only reason it's not a 10 is because of some of the crowd reactions at times, like I mentioned, looked a little bit fake. Also, since this is a movie based on a true story, as far as authenticity goes, I'm going to give this one a seven out of 10. There's it, a lot of liberties taken for sure, but most of them I definitely understand. Overall, I'm going to give this movie a freaking nine and a half out of 10. This is a freaking masterpiece, in my opinion. Fantastic baseball movie. Do not miss Moneyball. Let me know what you guys think in that comment section down below if you've seen it and what did you think. And look forward to the next baseball movie next Monday. Make sure to look for that poll and vote on it. I cannot wait. Moneyball. Do not miss this movie. And it's got a great cat. Robin Wright is also in this movie as Brad Pitt's ex-wife. Robin Wright, a.k.a. Claire Underwood. This has got a great cast. And it is a lot of fun. Don't miss it. Please let me know what you think down below of Moneyball. And look forward to the next movie review. Hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. And we'll talk to y'all next time. See ya. Opening day.